Hey everyone, welcome to yet another episode of Read AI with Me. So last year I have this playlist called Read AI with Me, of which I put videos up online showing people what I'm reading, what goes into my head when I'm reading research papers. This year I like to carry on that tradition and we're going to start off today's episode with the hottest topic in the world, ChatGPT. So with that being said, let's get started. So ChatGPT is awesome. Based on everything I've seen online, all the tutorials out there, I think it pretty much passes all the Turing tests that we can possibly think of. It is essentially a highly intelligent chatbot, interacts with us in a conversational manner and be able to think just like a human. Of course, it's not perfect. People online have been bugging this, figure out all sorts of caveat scenarios, gotcha scenarios that try to break the system. But overall, I would say this is a very important milestone of all of the advancements of artificial intelligence that we have had today. Before I get started, I just want to give a shout out to Damien. This guy is awesome. He's previously a machine learning engineer at Facebook, and he has his own AI newsletter, which I've been subscribing for a while. I read his stuff online. I think it's extremely helpful. And he actually had this nice summary about what he thinks a chat GPT is, and he actually lists out a couple of papers. So with that being said, Damien, if you're watching this episode, Thank you so much for contributing to the community. And in this episode, we're going to build up on your work. So this is a summary directly come from Damien. How is ChatGPT trained, right? First of all, it's based on a fine-tuned GPT-3 model. GPT-3 is short for the third generation GPT, which is Generative Pre-trained Transformers. So ChatGPT is an update version of that. And it actually used only 1.3 billion parameters comparing with GPT-3 which used an astonishingly large number as 175 billion parameters. So these are the steps that he lists out. First of all, there's going to be a pre-trained model, and we're going to fine-tune that pre-trained model under supervised setup. Then there's going to be some sort of reward model, and we're going to invite human laborers come in to rank the answers from the AI. We take that results, take that new labels, new ranks, and we're going to send all of that into a reinforcement learning algorithm by using PPO, or also known as Proximal Policy Optimization. So in this episode, we're going to dive into these building blocks and dissect them to see what they do. This is a diagram directly come from OpenAI website, and it breaks down to three steps, only three steps that you have to know to understand ChatGPT. The first step is very straightforward. It is a supervised learning with a text-to-text -text model. That's exactly what GPT does. It inputs a text and it spits out a text. So what that means is we have a sentence. Like for instance, we can have a sentence here saying the man is walking down the street. And what the text generation model does is it's reading in chunk of sentence, a sequence of words, and it's trying to predict what that next word is. And ChatGPT is no different. It falls under that world of text-to-text -text model. Now how it works is the AI is trying to learn the words that's going inside of it and based on large volume of corpus of training data, and the AI is trying to guess what the next word is based on the training data. So I would say in regards to the first step, all the magic is truly dependent on how good you collect your data. You can have a more complicated question in a data set, right? For example, you can say, hey, explain reinforcement learning to a six-year-old. And then you have human laborers coming in, write out a couple of answers. We give treats and punishments to teach whatever. And then you can train an AI to learn from the first sentence, use that as input, and generate the next sentence. And that becomes your Q&A model. So that is the first step of this entire orchestra. The second step is extremely interesting because it actually invites human laborers coming to the picture again for a second time. So how it works is, from the first step, we have a model. The model is trained. And then the second step, we take this model, we send in a couple of texts, and we let the model generate some sort of predictions. Maybe they're good, maybe they're bad, we don't know, that's okay. We're gonna have humans coming here to rank these answers, okay? So we're talking about a big room, physically have somebody coming here saying, that answer is good, that's bad, that's nonsense, that's not gonna work, and we collect all these information together, and that becomes another data set. And since this data set is based on reward because human ranked them, then we call this the reward model. So here's what the model looks like. Stage one 
you take some random text from some sort of corpus data set that you're using, and you have AI to read this text to make some predictions. And then in the very end, you have a human judge comes in to grade all these predictions. Maybe J is better than K, right? Let's write that down. You write that down, that becomes your benchmark, which you also call as what? Labels. So then there's a second stage. In the second stage, you collect these input label pair, right? You collect the input, you train a neural network, let this input go to the neural network, and you let the neural network generate a score. And the score is going to be the reward of that prediction. So you have a prediction J and prediction K, then they each carry a reward, RJ, RK. And this RJ, RK, guess what? You can compare the reward coming out of the second AI model with the rankings that this previous human just provided. So this is also called a human feedback learning. In other words, just like your usual data science pipeline where you train a model and then make a prediction and then humans come in to check the model performance, right? It's the same idea here, except that the judge is not done by human. It's not a human judge. It's an AI judge. This AI judge is able to detect if some predictions is good or bad. And that wraps up the second step of ChatGPT pipeline. So now we're down to the last step. In the last step, we're really talking about the reinforcement learning piece. So it's using this new concept called proximal policy optimization, or also known as PPO. So okay, what is going on here, right? In step three, what we're doing here is we want to optimize the policy because we don't really think the previously trained model from step one, step two is in good shape yet. So we want to update it. And we want to update it using the reward model that we created from step two. Let's not throw that away, right? That's the hard work we just done. But when we're updating the policy of this reward model, we don't just randomly update it, right? We update it according to PPO. So exactly what PPO is doing is it has this new cost function, which is a magical formula that's telling you how many mistakes your model is making. And then at the same time, it penalizes your model if your existing model that you're about to update deviates from the previous version too much. So that too much deviation is the important piece. And that's the novel piece here in this formula that previously didn't exist before, right? So in other words, in this third step, when the model is trying to learn new things, it doesn't just randomly update your gradients, whatever new data set come in, right? Think about what that will happen in reality. You're in the reinforcement learning world. You're not in supervised learning world. So why not using supervised learning? The reason to not use supervised learning is because supervised learning is difficult to be fine-tuned. It has lots of roadblock. And on top of that, it doesn't generalize, right? Supervised learning is solely dependent on training data, which come from one domain. If you want to generalize or go to a different domain, you have to use transfer learning, fine tune it, so that the model could perhaps perform better in another domain. That's a problem, right? Because in real world, when this machine is out there interacting with human, answering questions, it's not task specific, right? You can't expect to just solve one type of question task. You have to be able to solve a variety of different tasks. So to tackle that problem, we're talking about reinforcement learning. Because as your model is generating performance. And as humans react into the model, it's also generating new data. And you should be able to collect that new data and take advantage of that. And when you're updating your model, your model policy is deviating too much from before, then your model is going to jump all over the places. Lots of variance, lots of noise, you get nowhere. So PPO's job is not just to update the model, but also to ensure your model doesn't deviate too much from before. So with that being said, the last thing I want to say about this third step is this for loop here. We talk about first step and second step, right? Let's not forget that. Let's now use that in a loop. We have our model. We can use our model to say, hey, write a story about some character. Now the model is going to generate some new prompt. And then this new prompt is going to start generating text, right? Start making predictions. Say, hey, once upon a time, what happened to this character? And then this new prediction is now sent into another model, right? In step two, we talk about AI judge, right? That's precisely what this model is doing, the reward model. Now the second model, this AI judge, is gonna look at this prediction that the AI wrote, right? Once upon a time, what the story is about for this character, 
and then give it a reward. So this pipeline now is taking this reward, loop it back up to update the policy, to have the model learn, while at the same time doesn't deviate too much from the previous pattern of what this model is writing. Now from here, guess what? They're going to train this for loop again and again and again until the error is not within the acceptable threshold. So with that being said, that wraps up everything you need to know of chat GPT, which is why we're able to come up with all these fancy models, right? Here you have a pendulum that's able to find where it is, right? It's able to send out by itself. Or you have this old target game that you're landing a spaceship in a certain range, right? If you can do this, why can't Elon Musk land a rocket on a boat, right? And then on top of that, this is language model. So why can't we write some pseudo code and have the computer finish the rest of the function for us? That can be done now by using this kind of architecture. And why do we have to stop there, right? Let's continue this trend. Let's have AI finish our writings, help us write code, correct our grammar mistakes, you name it, right? The sky is the limit. So with that being said, hopefully you enjoyed this episode, and hopefully this episode sheds some light of what ChatGPT is doing and how it's being trained. And hopefully overall, you had a great experience watching this episode. If you like it, give a like and hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.